So, um, this is meant to be a lightning talk. Um, I'm originally from the West Country, so I don't tend to talk that quickly. Um, but hopefully it's a lightning subject because we're going to be making some code a bit faster. Um, so hopefully that'll be interesting to people. Um, so I thought I'd start by doing a little bit of my history with a bit, with a bit of JS thrown in. Thrown in. So um, I actually started programming in, in, in the 90s for GC Marconi. Did um, like a uh, missile tracking system, which was really interesting. Um, there was no JavaScript there. Um, then I went, uh, worked at a company called Coldwood Digital, which I actually set up, so the wood in Coldwood is me. Um, and that was really cool. I got a, it was a proper startup. There's two of us started up in the 90s. Um, and yeah, I, the whole history of JavaScript came, came with it, really. So everything from sort of jQuery, um, which people in this room may or may not know about. But um, it was a big deal when it came along. Um, there weren't that much, you know, um, there to help me with async programming. It really, really helped. Um, and, you know, Google only came out of beta in 2000, so we started really early. So, yeah, Google didn't exist. Um, and, you know, Facebook was like 2005. Um, and it basically, because we were a startup, we were doing everything with everything as free as possible. So, um, yeah, whatever free stacks there were at the time, so it was Linux and Apache, you know, messing around with Perl and doing whatever we could to make something dynamic and, and interesting on the web. Um, then obviously, yeah, later on, um, JavaScript take, took a big big part of that. So started building applications. Um, I actually met the um, first people that started, um, have you heard of Apache Cordova, anyone? Yeah, so uh, mobile framework. Um, I actually went out to Germany and met them when they first started. Um, that was a um, chap called Brian LaRue, um, it was a company called Nitobi, and they were the first to sort of think, actually, do you know what, we could use JavaScript to build apps. And so they were embedding um, web pages inside apps and building apps that way. Um, and very quickly, we managed to build an app within like three, four days. We had um, this company called Knight Frank, who were um, estate agents. We got their, web their website turned into an app within you know, days, and they were, they were dead happy with that. Um, and then right near the end of then, um, Node was released. And Node was a massive, massive game changer in JavaScript because you start using it on the server side as well. Um, so I then went to work at a company called Pixel. There might be some ex-Pixel people around. Um, Pixel was at Ace. It was a really good company to work for and loads of JavaScript there. So um, yeah, working um, again in Cordova and we built apps for TVs, um, iPhones, um, Android, all the rest of it. Um, and then I went on to work in Angular as well, which is another JavaScript framework. Um, and I also led the HTML5 video player team, which was um, doing all DRM play back in different browsers and all the rest of it, which was a really fascinating project to work on. Um, I then worked on uh, worked for Moon International and now Hubblesoft, which I think are in the building buildings. So there might be some hubblers here. Um, but that was, again, JavaScript based. So I was doing a lot of stuff with uh, D3 and uh, like dynamic visualizations and uh, what they called the landscape, which was this way of uh, basically doing queries on data in a really sort of, yeah, easy way, um, which is a lot of fun, a lot of D3 in there. And um, I then worked at the University of York for a while. Um, there I actually introduced a lot of JavaScript there, so they started using JavaScript more in, in the back end, in Node.js, so for timetabling systems and things like that. So um, lots of experience of trying to write things that ran quickly, because um, we wanted to try and get data over, ideally, as real time as we could. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. Uh, and I now currently work for a company called Revlifter, which no one would have heard of. Um, but we do lots of um, work helping websites make more money, essentially. And so it's important for us that our JavaScript runs quickly because we're running it on a lot of big brands and so it needs to, needs to be running efficiently. Cool. Um, so let's go on to the meat and potatoes. So um, if we go to positively.com, which is my blog, the website, which has only got one article on it because... Yeah, like we all start these things up and think we're going to write lots of articles and this one took me ages. Um, so uh, I've just written the one uh, and that is this JS faster than Rust. Um, so if I quickly go through um, what the article says and what it does. Um, so I talk about the fact that, you know, J JS is not as fast as um, some of the like, pre-compiled languages, but you can make it fast. And um, doing this exercise actually got to go surprisingly quick, um, actually quicker than Rust did. Um, so what I'll do is I'll quickly let the primogen explain. So this is, a, this is one of those um, uh, Christmas, uh, well, what are they call the code dev challenges that they do. Um, uh, Advent of code, that's it. So I don't know if the audio is going to work. Find 14 distinct characters in a long string. Once you find 14 distinct characters, you just report the position directly after those. If you're not familiar with Advent of Code, it's kind of like a fun Santa-themed holiday adventure in which you're solving problems to bring Christmas joy. 
So that's the primary region explaining the problem. So essentially what you've got to do in this, in this um, problem is to find the first unique characters in... Um, so you've got a block of um, text and you've got to find the first 14 unique characters when it's sort of classic uh, advent of code problem. So um, initial sort of problems you start thinking about. So this is Mike Bostock. If you don't know Mike Bostock, he wrote D3. He's a bit of a dude. He did the advent. He does the advent code and knocks it out in seconds. He's one of, usually one of the fastest to do it in JavaScript anyway. Um, and hopefully you can see that code well enough. But essentially what he's doing is um, grabbing the string, uh, going through it, getting chunks of that string, and then just saying um, is the is the size of it. So creating a set. So in JavaScript you say create a set which uniques them all, and then says oh, is that is that size the same as the window? So it's not terribly efficient, but it works. It'll, it'll crack through and do the code. So we can see there that that takes. Uh, I can't remember how many nanoseconds it was. 1.4 million nanoseconds. That's important for later. Um, but yeah, so that's it's, it's fast enough. And nine times out of ten, you just leave it there, you'd be fine. Um, but sometimes, just sometimes, you need to be able to make things a little bit quicker. So whenever I'm looking to optimize code, I always like to think about um, the iterations, so like how many times I'm doing a thing on the code, the computations, so like what I'm doing with that code when I'm doing it, and then simplify simplifications. Can I simplify this code in a way that simpler for me, but also simpler for the computer to be able to do its job? So um, my first thoughts on this were to do a sort of head-first jump algorithm. So I've done a sort of little bit of a runner of it running through. So essentially what this is doing is going through each character of the string, waiting until it finds a duplicate, flashing in red, and then it jumps on. So this is sort of a fairly simple way of thinking, right, you know, this is how, how I could write the code. So you can see what it's doing. The I is just where it's starting. The W is it's going through looking for those unique 14 characters that we see there, it's found it. And then at the bottom, we've just got some form of state. So you need some way of saying, have I seen that character before or not? So um, quite quickly it works out that actually a tail first jump implementation is what I've called it is actually faster. So what this is doing is this is starting from the 14 character and working its way back until it finds a duplicate. So this, as you could probably see, was quite a bit quicker. And if I've got, I've got them two running, I can run them both side by side with some counts running. And what you can see here is so the, the head first jump one is jumping along and the tail first one is like essentially a lot, lot faster, not quite orders of magnitude faster, but it's a lot faster. And the reason it's faster is because it's being able to find those duplicates faster because it's working its way back through the strings. Seems like a silly little thing that makes a big difference when you're working on lots of data. Um, so you can see there that top one's still running and it hasn't found an answer and it's already in the 60s, whereas the other one's already found the answer in 37 counts. So this sort of works. I go into a little bit about permutations and combinations, but essentially, if you just had a random string, the chances of two characters to get the same code is very close to one as you get towards 14 anyway. So the chances are that you're going to get two characters the same. So um, that just means you know, it's, it's more likely to do it and you're not having to compute work on so many of them. So the next bit I look at is computation. So this is a slightly um, trickier bit, but hopefully everyone can follow me. Um, it's not too complicated. So essentially what we're doing here is looking at the bits of work that we need to do. So what we need to do is take each character from the string, check if we've seen it already, and if we've not, add it to the state, and then we keep on going until we get to 14. If we have seen it before, then get rid of it. So what we can do to do that is actually quite a simple way of using um, uh, bit, bit shifting. And in order to do that, what we first need to do is turn characters into letters. So if it, not many people realize, but a lot of characters are actually stored as ASCII numbers. And you can do that in JavaScript by saying um, char code app, and it will give you the give you the um, uh, yeah give you the character code for it. Um, and what's quite useful, um, whoever wrote ASCII obviously thought about this. And if you do a modulus 32, the modulus 32 is one, A is one, and um, B is two. So um, that's a really neat way of us turning basically turning letters into numbers, and numbers are easier for us to work from. And obviously, if we can start from one instead of 97, that's easier to easier to work with as well. So then what we do is we use bit shifting to store state. So we need to work out, have we seen this character before or not? So what we can do is use one single 32-bit integer, or 64-bit, depending on what your um, uh, computer's running, uh, or your um, language supports, to store all of the state to say, have we seen a letter or not? So the way this works is what we can do is we can say, um, a one is, um, is when it's bit shifted over. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot the right bit up. 
yeah, so when it's bit shifted, it becomes four. Uh, so B becomes four, A becomes one, and B become, uh, Z becomes whatever that big number is down there. But we don't really care about that. What we care about is this binary representation of the number. So what we're doing is we're just flipping bits in one 32-bit number to represent our state as of have we seen those 26 characters or not. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you ever need to get to a situation where you need to deal with more than 26 characters or 26 numbers of things, um, I really recommend looking into warring bitmaps. I don't know if people have looked into those, but they're something that, that a lot of core databases um, use to do a lot of things when you want to, say, joining data together. If you've got things in numbers, it can do it really, really quickly because it's dealing with these bit sets. But we're dealing with a tiny bit set here, so we're cool. We're just using one 32-bit number. So then we need to work out, have we seen it before or not? And that's actually fairly easy. So I've used binary notation here just to help it easier to see in JavaScript. So um, what we've got here is I've got an I. If a B comes along, have I seen it or not? Well, I can just add them together. If the answer is zero, then I've not seen it. If the answer is anything but zero, which I can show you in the one below here, then it means that we have seen it already. And so we need to start again. Um, and then when we need to say, right, we've seen it, we now want to add it to the state, we can OR it on. So what we can do is take all these two numbers together, and then what you can see there is we've got a nice binary representation, but we've seen I and B. So hopefully that makes sense. So what, why that's really cool is that means we can use one 32-bit number to store all of our state for our, our little function. And that's really, really useful because we can do that really quickly. Um, I go off on a bit of a tangent about fast mod here, but actually uh, the compiler deals with that, so you can read that in your own time if you'd like to. Um, so that's, that means we can now really quick, so we've got a really fast algorithm, we can do our tail first going back through it, we can store our state really efficiently by using one 32-bit number, and then the next bit we look at is, well, what, how can we simplify this code? So what we could actually do is just use two while loops. So we do one while loop um, to go right through the string, and another one to say, have we gone through the 14 characters or not? So it's really quite simple, and we can simplify the code down quite a bit. So what we can do now is we can look at the solutions. I won't play the videos for this, but the um, Benny solution is here, who's one of the people that was on the, on the Prime Engine video. And again, you can take this away and, and watch it in your own time. Um, but yeah, so essentially what he does is he is going through the string here and he's basically going off like this. He, so he's basically going through the whole string and just um, saying, have a bit uh, doing a filter and count the number of ones. So he's creating that 32 bit number like we described, but he's just counting the number of ones and just popping them off and off and off like that. So obviously the problem with that means he's got to go over the whole string in order to be able to do to get to his answer. Um, then David's solution is a bit cleverer. So this is the one that's using the, that, um, it's a little bit more complicated because it's Rust, but essentially it's creating a window of code and he's doing that thing where he's hopping over. So he's taking, he's creating slices and creating chunks every time and that's not terribly efficient. So that's where we can make things faster. So I've made a simple JS solution, which is just two while loops. And surprisingly, when I run it on my machine, it's faster. Now I have cheated a little bit here. Um, I've, uh, when I've run the JS, I've run it in a way, and again, there's a supporting repo that goes along with this, so feel free to check it out. Um, I've run JavaScript in a way, so I won't go into the depths of it here, but I've linked some videos in my slides at the end. Um, in the core of the way JavaScript works, it passes all of your code, and it creates a little bit of inefficient bytecode first, and then it has a thing called TurboFan, and there's now a new thing called Maglev that can turn that into faster bytecode later on. So, um, I've cheated for this. I've already got it to do the passing and do the turbo fan and do the maglev to do the comparison. So, um, and this is this surprised me because in older, like literally three or four versions of Node, it was um, in nowhere near as fast as it is now. So it's obviously got faster. Um, yeah, I'm serious. Don't call me Shirley. Um, yeah, and then I've done the same loose solution in Rust, and the same solution Rust was marginally faster, um, which is not surprising because it's simpler. Um, and then I also did a version in Zig as well, just because, yeah, just for completeness. I quite like Zig and I've been playing around with Zig a bit and uh, yeah, that, that was um, quite fast as well. Um, so the article's there, I'll, um, I'll, I'll link to it at the end, but um, yeah, so hopefully that all, um, where's my slides gone? Yeah, so that's, um, that's there on posdevy.com and feel free, there's a, a repo, so if anyone wants to have a go in some other languages, I was going to have a go in um, uh, Golang and a few other ones just, just, just to compare it and have a go. Um, 
So that's it. Um, so I can't ever do a talk about JS without talking about these two videos. Um, one is what is the heck is the event loop anyway, um, which every JavaScript dev should look at and should know about. And this explains how the event loop in JavaScript works, which is pretty much core cool when you're using, doing anything to do with JavaScript. And another one is the story of V8 performance. So if you really want to know how JavaScript works under the hood, um, V8 is the people that, um, what is, is the engine behind Node. And that video is really, really worth watching because they go for a deep dive and explain like, the reason why it's actually worth giving your variable, making your variable an integer at the start. It makes a big difference, it certainly can. Um, oh, that's about to play one of the videos, sorry. And then play the other. Sorry, that's a quirk in, um, yeah, and I mentioned Zig already, but yeah, I think I'm keeping an eye on Zig. Um, I've been, um, I don't know if you know about like a uh, tiger beetle and some of the tiger style stuff that's going off in Zig. That looks really, really cool. Um, so that's my, um, yeah, that's the language I'm keeping an eye on at the moment. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there's any questions, but yeah, I did run through it a bit quick, but. So, I have one question to start off. Yeah. Do you know why the, the Zig version is faster than Rust and why uh, the JavaScript was even faster than the Zig? So, I actually don't, yeah, I don't know. I've had a look in Godbolt and I'm not a, um, I'm not a, uh, I haven't done, um, low-level programming in a long time, like, uh, oh, what's it called? Ah, oh, I've forgotten its name. But yeah, I, haven't, I, haven't, yeah I, I can't read Godbolt, so I can't understand it. But it's, it's, it's longer, I would say that much. So the, so the, so the Rust code it generates, the, the, the machine code it generates is longer in Rust than it is in, uh, in, um, in Zig, it just is. So it's doing more operations on the processor. Um, Godbolt is, I think it's a little bit like um, Assembler, but it's slightly different, but it's that, it's that sort of low level, and I haven't done Assembler in a long time, so I can tell you about it. You can see it moving registers and stuff in it, so yeah. But yeah, feel, Godbolt's awesome, by the way, if you haven't used that for doing, um, yeah, it's brilliant. It's, um, so in, it's in browser, you can put um, any programming language you want, and it'll show you the machine code that it generates. So that's something that's the tool I use, yeah, um, yeah, quite a bit, that's really useful. Yeah, Godbolt's the surname of the person who made it. It's actually called Compiler Explorer. And, oh, thank yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Chris? Yeah. How did you... I'll just show Hell it. <laughs> How did you count the bits? How did I count the bits? Yes. Um, so I think... Uh, I can't remember how I did it now. Um, so I think... Uh, got in my code here. So I, I just kept a count. Yeah, so, I got, um, so I've got the state and then I just kept, kept a count. Yeah, so I didn't have to count the bits up in mine. So I just kept a counter. So I just kept, uh, said, said, you know, I've gone back through, do I get to 14 or not? So I've not had to count the bits. Like, um, so in the Rust version, they've done a count all the bits up, but I haven't done that. I've just kept, kept a counter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah, oh, so it's simple. And I'm just using the state to say, have I seen it or not, and add it to the state or not. So I'm not actually do the counting. Is that part of the performance difference? Then? Possibly, yeah, for the, for, the, for the Rust implementation, the other person did definitely, yeah. Anything else? Hiya. Um, if I'm not a, a D3 maintainer and um, I'm not really working in, in Rust, are there many sort of use cases in your day-to-day -day life of sort of improving sort of regular Java applications where this kind of sort of trickery in, in a weird way would, would be useful? Or would you yeah. sort of stray away from that to make it more sort of readable and sort of understandable? So, so nine... 99% of the time, I'd keep it readable and keep it useful for yeah. people to be able to use. But if you've ever looked at flame graphs, um, if you could get, get into the nuts and bolts of in Chrome, and when you've got something that's running, like you'll find hot functions, and I've, I've found many in my, in my class, and you'll find a hot function, and you'll look at what that function is doing, and you realise that you know, somebody's decided to turn it into an object, and then into something else, and then into something else, to just get a number from it. And you think, well, actually, no, I could just... Do, or, or the classic is that there might be a filter, a map, a filter, a map, but it's hidden because there's functions calling functions that are calling functions, and you'd never write a, a map then a filter because that's insane, but somebody's done it because at a high level it's doing a map over a load of code, and then later on it's doing a filter on it, and you can look at that and go, actually, no, I can f just do it all in one loop. And if, yeah, so I wouldn't use it all at the time, but I, but I would, and if you ever do that, I'd recommend putting a performance test around it so nobody goes and ninjas it out again, which has happened to me in the past. Um, somebody's gone and, you know, turned my code into better code, but it's actually yeah, affected performance. So if you put a little perf test in there and put it in CR, they can't get away with it. So. 